All right, here we go. Too short. Welcome back. What's up, man? You were a regular on Vlad TV for, for a oh, lot of years. Over the years, I've been... I've been Even before Vlad TV, when we were yeah. doing Ghost Ride the Whip. And I've, been, I've been being interviewed by you for yep. many, many moons. Many, many moons. Well, first and foremost, the pimp tape is out. Finally. It took how many years? It took me two years to record it, but... Um, but it wasn't just like <clears throat> I was trying to get this perfect album together too. I just recorded a lot of songs. Right. And in the end, in the end, finally, we were like, okay, we got a release date. Let's put it together. And we just grabbed from everywhere and put the best songs that fit the theme. But I've got a lot of a lot of projects to follow this one too. I already slated. What album number is this? We're calling it twenty, man. I kind of lost count, but it's, <laughs> I, I think if we, we we sat down one day and we we realized I had nineteen albums. And then, like, we gotta do one more. 20 one more. albums deep. Mm -hmm. And your first album dropped what year? 1985. 1985. Mm -hmm. Over it was, 30, it was called Don't Stop Rapping. Don't Stop Rapping. You're talking about over 30 years. Yeah, man. Dropping albums, one after another. And the pimp tape is hot. It's yeah, good. no, I've been listening to it all day. Yeah, this is a good album. Uh, oh, yeah, now you pulled out some shit on this. I mean, I'm looking at just the, the guest appearances. Mm -hmm. Two Chains, Snoop, T.I., Schoolboy Q, G Easy, E40, Dream, Ty Dollar Sign, French Montana, Jeremiah, Mozzie, Mr. Fab, yeah. you know, Neff the Pharaoh, Richie kinda, Rich. Kind of impressive for OG. Yeah, and, and Dr. Dre does an interlude on top of that. And Khaled. And Khaled, mm -hmm. right. So I, I just, I, I, I was being motivated by Mr. Fab, you know Fab. Yeah, of course. And he's like uh, in my ear, like, man, you you too short, man. Well, well, you gotta, you got, you know, like you gotta do it big, man. So, you know, he was my, uh, I, I call him the A and R for this album because okay. he, he sat with me through the whole album. He, a lot of the hooks, a lot of the, you know, even like some of the subjects and stuff. We were like in the studio, knocking that shit out, but. Um, you know, he, he was he was just very adamant about. I was under some shit where I I didn't really feel like calling everybody on there and saying, "Hey man, let's do a song." So we did all kind of shit, man. We did we we made it happen. Okay. We made it happen. Okay, and I remember I think it was on the on the intro song you said uh, what was the verse? Six platinum albums, four gold. Mm -hmm. People say he's so hot, but he's so old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like how you just own it. I mean, it is what it is, man. When I was, when I was um, at every stage of my career, man, I just, I, you know, I just lived up to it. Before I went and got my new teeth, I, I lived, you know, I just, I did it, like, you know, whatever. So, it's just, it just, it's me, man. And it's true, though, you know. They say this motherfucker can make some good music, but he old as fuck. How old are you now? Fifty-two. Fifty-two. But I do dope ass shows. Yeah. I do a lot of songs with. Different artists, no matter what age, I'm, I'm, I'm active, man. Well, 15 million albums sold. I think that's what you said. Probably say more that than that, man. I just, I just, I just throw out numbers because they sound good, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's all this stuff can be disputed. It's probably a lot more than 15 million albums, though. 15, 20 million, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. After a while, after a while, you just stop counting, man. You just like you, you, you just, you just live a good life. I mean, when you look back on, on everything you've done, 30 mm -hmm. years in. Like, what do you think you're most proud of? Um, <clears throat> most proud of in this career would just be uh, the people that I brought along for the ride, you know, hmm. and and the things that they did with it. Like, just you know, the Aunt Banks and the Little Johns, and just so many more. Just people who just they got a chance because of me, and they made something out of it. And even the people who who just you know got to taste it a little bit, you know, seen some money or or got on a, a platinum album or something like that, and you got a platinum plaque hanging up in, in their house, and mm. they're proud of that moment. So I didn't, I didn't just, I wasn't selfish with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you put a lot of people on. Just, I just put a lot of people, put a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets. Yeah, that's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you're still here. You know, this many years later, people are still checking for you, still doing shows. You look good. You look healthy. Yeah, man. Work. Just try, trying to, trying to be a. You know, a, a real OG man, a real responsible OG. I was, I was young and wild now. Yeah. I, I toned it down later in life. I, I, ke I kept my wild side a little longer than I should have. But I, lately, give me like the last three, four, four years, I've been toning it down a little bit. You have toned it down. 
it's only because of like social media and and you know what that's bringing to the table and so many other things that the, the culture changing in entertainment hollywood you know the whole bill cosby trickle down and mm -hmm. and me and so many other people uh have, have faced you know accusations and, and about yeah bullshit some real others but at the same time it's changed the culture and the way a lot of us used to be you know the wild super wild that shit gets you in a lot of trouble now man it just you just get a lot of misquotes and a lot of yeah. footage of you doing things that the three minute version would be explained but the <laughs> 20 second version is like fuck you know you have no kids no kids 52 years old mm -hmm. and i'm just going to guess that you have not been using condoms every time uh well i've been i've been <laughs> i've been all kind of porn stars i buy magnums by the 36 box by the 36 box i've definitely uh run out quite often but yeah you're right it's not always a condom thing man yeah. you 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 get people that you trust you get people that over the years you did did some gambling and whatnot but you know so far so good and i i spent a lot of my young years doing what everybody else did when I was very young, high school actually, I got a girl pregnant. She had an abortion. Oh, you got a girl pregnant in high school? Yeah, that child would have been in her thirties by now. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, and you, you know, got, um, and you, did uh, you pay for the abortion? Uh, I don't think I did. I think we were young, man. I don't, okay. I don't that, and then probably a couple more times in my life, been in the same situation. I had a girlfriend who had a miscarriage. I mean, these are all things that happened before I turned twenty-five. Okay. So. But you were already a rap star by 25. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at some point I started making a lot of money and I started seeing, you know, my homies who had kids at young ages and these kids are like seven, eight, nine, ten at the time and what they're going through with the courts and and not being responsible, some of them, and, you know, just the drama with the baby mamas and stuff. And I just, I, I looked at where I was at in life and I made a decision to myself in my mid-20s that, I just didn't want to be a baby daddy and I was having fun. I didn't really want the, you know, I didn't want the responsibility of being this party guy who got a, you know, you know, a family and I'm like, I, I'm like the tug of war. I've seen so many people do it. I didn't want to do it. Okay. So I, I avoided that shit by using a lot of condoms and by doing a lot of pulling out. Um, I, you know, I made it. I made it fun when I had to. Like you're the, the pullout king, and, and you know, girls get mad at you sometimes for that shit. They like, they're like, why you always do that shit? And I'm like, I'm not trying to get you pregnant. I'm like, it's a habit. <laughs> so uh, then I got to my 40s, man, and I didn't really feel so strongly about not making babies in my 40s. I've even had a couple of, uh, I've been in the court a couple times with being accused of being the father. And oh, really? And, and they weren't mine. So women have taken you to court and said, I am absolutely sure Too Short is the father. Yeah, I got that letter that said, um, if you don't appear on such and such date, you are automatically the father. Oh, wow. And you okay. Got like, and, you know, some people ignore that letter. And then you got 18 <laughs> years of payments for a child that might not be yours. And, and they're not going to take the DNA test at that point because they have a guaranteed check on no, the No, you're, yeah, you're, you're done. Like you, it's, I don't even know how, I don't know how you reverse that. Th that's a real thing. You could become a default, a default father <laughs> by yeah, not like, showing up to ignoring, court. Ignoring paperwork, yep. Wow. Okay. So you had a check couple of comments. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure the people are going to chime in <laughs> on this. So, okay. Did you ever get a vasectomy? No, what, I don't even know what that is. What is that? that that's when they um, they make, do that little operation. You can't make babies? Where, yeah, you can't get anyone pregnant. Nah. I, um... Because I just had interviewed Warren Sapp. Did you get a vasectomy done? Yeah, or I got kicked just... in the groin. I'm good. Oh, oh, that's it. Yeah, you I'm got the vasectomy. The groin. Yeah, I'm done. Why do you think so few men actually do this? I think they really are going on that old spell. You know, because that was a horror story. Your balls are drop and this and that, and you be messed up for life. It's outpatient. Yeah, it's a I laser. Heard. Yeah. Yeah, but most guys don't know this because they're thinking of the old days when they used to cut you open and whatever they used to do. I mean, guys used to come with like appendectomy marks out. No, I, I do have intentions of a, a family in the future. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I've, I've changed my outlook on, I, I was just telling you that, like I got to my 40s and 
I started feeling a different way. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I used to resist it. Mm -hmm. So f since my like mid 40s, I kind of just been like going with the flow, you know? I'm not resisting it. I'm not trying to make it happen. I'm just going with So the if flow. someone gets pregnant, they get pregnant. You're not going to the abortion clinic anymore. No. I'm actually, uh, bro, you, you know. You, you might get married? I might. I might too short might start a family, man. Just just hang tight. We don't want Okay. Wanna, we don't I'm, wanna... I'm excited. Yo, I wanna get I wanna get the invite to the wedding. Uh, I'm just I'm just putting that out there. If there is a wedding, a too short wedding, well the bachelor <laughs> party, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but the wedding as well. I'll, I'll pull out a suit. Hey. <laughs> hey man. Hey man, it, listen. There comes a time. There comes a time. I you mean maturity. Um, if you asked me this question ten years ago, I'd have been like, fuck no. <laughs> but you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a different guy now. Well, I mean you talked about, uh, you know, when the whole Me Too thing started to really bubble, mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, the art of trying to fuck is over. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the Me Too, the culture changing as it should. And I couldn't really necessarily say the art of fucking. <laughs> the actual takedown is over. Just, you know, just that whole pursuit, the way it was a... Um, you know, it was the way it used to be was kind of, I've been educating myself, man. We, you know, we were doing things inappropriately at times. We were, we were really like fucking breathing down females necks and just, just let me fuck, let me fuck, let me fuck. You know what I mean? Not even people who were raping or assaulting or being inappropriate, just guys that just were fucking horny. Like, can I fuck, can I fuck, can I fuck, can I fuck? It was mm -hmm. a whole big, like five guys hanging out. What trying to do? We trying to fuck, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're trying to find girls to fuck. That was, so I just say, it It may be just my life, but it just seems to be a better time now where, you know, we gotta, you gotta respect, you gotta be in mutual respect. You gotta, you know, you gotta, it's a certain way that you gotta meet a woman, you know what I mean? I mean, people are and, still fucking. Yeah, but you know, I, I kinda, um, I kinda think that uh, all that workplace you know, all that shit, you can't go to the to the water to water cooler without a coworker talking about your ass, look sir, all that shit. That's what I'm talking about. Just the the, the thirst of it. Yeah. It kinda you know, and, and it's I think it's the right time for the shit though, man, because we just elected a president who still got elected after being quoted as saying, grab him by the pussy. Right. And you know, the Me Too movement came in and it didn't even apply to his ass. Pretty much. <laughs> you know? He so, still he still has a job. So at the same time, we started, men and women, we started kind of checking ourselves. Forced to, we were, you know, the, the society took a big look and said, this shit is bullshit. All these bosses spanking their uh, secretaries on the ass, all this shit just been going on for 50 fucking years. Let's end it. So I think it's a good thing, bro. But I mean, I'm, I'm also saying that I was one of the thirsty guys, just like, yeah. let me fuck, let me fuck. But, but you right. Know, we, I mean, if you talk about someone, you know, because your, your theme throughout really all your albums has been sex. Yeah. You know, you did not drop a conscious album my, at some my, point. You know, my, <laughs> my approach was, hey, what's up? Can I get my dick sucked? That was, right, you know, exactly. And I wasn't biting my tongue. I, I, and no. it wasn't uh, anything other than <laughs> sincere. <laughs> right. What do you think was your greatest sexual exploit? Like, what, what was the most over-the-top thing you ever did sexually? Oh, man. I, did, I, I had an over-the-top sexual life. I understand that. So, <laughs> but if you were to pick one night, <laughs> one absolutely crazy situation. Oh, well, um, Vlad, man, <laughs> the stories from me would be, <laughs> the, st the normal stories would be unbelievable. Then I tell you these spectacular stories. And I, give, I, me one, give me one spectacular story, come on. I've done everything that they haven't done, man. I mean, with, with uh, How many to, women like, at one time? The most number of women naked right there with you. I've been in a house full of housefuls of naked women. I mean, housefuls. I probably in one night uh, I fucked four different chicks. All everybody's in the same room and just whatever. I, but we've done that a lot of times, man. It's like yeah, I've done I've done three at one, you know, same yeah. night. So it's like it's like it's not really that wild even to me. To my to my, I'm the kind of guy who I, I I've had a lot of menage a trois. Yeah. But when you sit there and saying. I'm in the house with three, four, five chicks. We kicking and we just having a good night, whatever. I'm not like everybody come lay in the bed with me. It might be a 
about a you know a good twelve hour encounter of falling asleep, waking up in this room, that room, and you just like by the end of the weekend or something, a lot of sex is happening. You know, I've I've yeah. had fun weekends, like just not not an encounter. Like you go somewhere and you just in a fucking I used to I used to always go to Vegas and get um. People like to go get like you like get a hotel suite or whatever. I would get a suite, and then I would get the adjoining room to the suite, and then open all the damn doors. So we got this big ass thing. I'd probably invite out like maybe like eight, nine, ten chicks. I'm not trying to fuck them all. Sometimes I wouldn't even try to fuck any of them. But at the end of the weekend, it's just it's just been a great weekend. It's just been like <laughs> right. you know, it's just everybody walk gets comfortable. They all walk around the room naked. They laying around and. They getting dressed in front of me. I just, I, I live that life. Yeah, I live that life a lot for a very long time, mm -hmm. and it just was, you know, the people who know me, they just, it was just normal. I just, I hang out with these chicks. Uh, it looks to be like, oh, he probably trying to fuck out, but they, I, I was on that vibe where these are my friends. Whether I'm getting hit tonight or just laying next to her, I mean, these, this is. We, we like a family, so mm -hmm. I, I did that lifestyle. The new album's called The Pimp Tape. The Pimp Tape is an appropriate title. Uh, how many how many albums have had the word pimp in them? Of mine? Yeah. Shorty the Pimp? Um, I, I, Bunch sure. of them. Right? And your nickname is Shorty the Pimp. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my question is... Born the Mac, that's a pimp reference. Yeah. Have you ever actually been a pimp? Have you ever actually had a prostitute that reported back to <laughs> you and said, here's some money I have gotten from having sex with other men. There you go, daddy. I like to say it like this. I, I truly possess pimp game. Okay. If I had to pimp in my younger years, I could have. If I had to pimp now, I would pimp. Um, I, but I don't, I've never considered myself a pimp because I think that a pimp does a very specific thing and does it well and does it consistently. And all I can ever say is that hoes have given me money. Hoes have given me money on just like a here, and hoes have given me money like here, 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 over and over again. Mm -hmm. And every hoe that ever gave me money, I promise you, I didn't pimp on her. I didn't say, bitch, go get my money. I didn't say, where's my fucking money? I just let her put it in my hand. <laughs> and you and took it. <laughs> at the same time, you know, I lived in Vegas for a long time, so. Mm -hmm. You're like you would you would get a hoe by default or some shit like like I, I went on a date with a chick who was just a normal chick she was like a normal looking regular chick and I, when I think back on it it all made a lot of sense we met for breakfast like the late night breakfast not the early morning breakfast at like 5 a.m. so we sit down to eat and she keeps asking me questions <laughs> and I said to her like just I was so not in the moment I said, are you interviewing me? Which is like a term that you would interview somebody if you're thinking about linking up with them and doing business together. Pimp hoes, pimp, pimp and hoes, you know? And she said, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this bitch, is you, you want me to? And she was like, I, I thought you, I was, I was just, I was not in the moment. I thought I was with a square chick. I'm sitting there having breakfast with a hoe. She's asked me, do you want to pimp on me? And I'm sitting there thinking this bitches want to go on a fucking date. So. <laughs> I have moments like that too, and then you, you know my pimp homies that have been like pimp on that bitch. Right. But so you were just trying to fuck. I was just fucking with a hot chick, you yeah. know. Yeah. Right. But a lot of crazy shit, man. A lot of crazy shit. But you know, a hoe walked up to me one night at a party and handed me about seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars and said, "You're the reason why I'm hoeing," and walked away. She never told me her name. <laughs> the bitch never even looked back over her shoulder. Wow. Just like, bam. And I counted, I'm like, 15, 6, 7, I'm like, dang, okay. Drinks on me. <laughs> Does that make me a pimp? I don't know. <laughs> that makes me pimp-ish for sure. If it walks like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I know um, I've actually, um, I've actually been very inspirational to a lot of careers mm -hmm. on both sides of that, that field, whereas um, you know, my music is almost like a, it's almost like the orientation. Right. You got a new young hoe or something and you need her to be in that right frame of mind, play a lot of certain two short songs and while you talk your talk, the song talks it too and she's like, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. 
And then, you know, I, I even had a homie who, um, he used to reward some of his hoes with a, uh, with a chance to meet Too Short. <laughs> really? Those, they would go like this, it would be like. <laughs> that was the grand prize? The door would pop open and they'd be like, bitch, there he goes, say what's up. They'd be like, oh, hey, what's up, what's up? He's like, yeah, man, the bitch, been, she been working good, man. I told the bitch she could meet Too Short, man, you know. <laughs> and that, the bitch would be like happy. So like she'd hold up for a, a yeah. meet and greet with Too Short. What do you consider tricking? What do I consider tricking? Mm -hmm. I consider that the exchange of currency or some type of material things for either pleasure, friendship, or just for some goddamn odd reason that you just like giving away shit to, to women. Because some people give away shit, they just like, I bought her a TV and you ain't, you ain't even seen her titties. So I think tricking is just some, it's, it, it is a, uh, it is the, the action of giving money, simply mm -hmm. money, whatever, for pussy. But you can interpret that in so many different ways. Have you ever tricked? I, I bought some pussy in Brazil back okay. in the 90s. And I, um, <laughs> <clears throat> no, literally, I, I did because it was like, the, the, the way it was, it, it was the baddest pictures you've ever seen. And it was like, they said, see every girl in this club? They're all for sale. And I'm like, all of them? They're like, yeah, they're all like college students. If you if you spend like, what was it, 50, but I don't know what the number was back then. Mm -hmm. You spend this amount, you help her get through college. I'm like, I want to put her through college, <laughs> and I want to put her through college. So Okay, but. But it, in recent years, I think I've, um, I gave a host some money one time just to like hang out. She had some, like, some big ass titties or something. I'm like, just hang out. and. Pull them big ass titties out and just hang out, and it was just it was just for the wallpaper. But you spend money on women. I feel like at the same time, if you buy pussy, if you negotiate with her and say, "How much do mm -hmm. I have to give you for pussy?" That's blatant tricking. Right. I feel like if you're like going on dinner dates, if you're taking trips, if I'm buying a plane ticket, flying you out, whatever. I'm not buying the pussy. You don't have to fuck me. You feel me? We do, we're doing this shit. We just, this, this, this is what I'm doing. But I'm not expecting anything like a plate of food at an expensive restaurant is a blowjob, is a blowjob trade-off. We're not doing it like that. Right, Cause, but for example, like I've heard a lot of people say, you know, when you look at celebrities mm -hmm. who quote unquote trick, buy pussy or whatever, these, these types of men have access to women all the time. Mm -hmm. They're not paying for the sex; they're paying for you to leave. Mm -hmm. we know when they're the when they're done, they do not want to go and talk to you about your your childhood issues and you okay, know. Okay, I'm not like saying that. that there's anything wrong with tricking mm -hmm. if that's what you do. All I'm saying is, how could I exist if you didn't exist? <laughs> it would be no pimp ass too short if it wasn't no trick ass you. You know what I mean? So <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. the same, it's the same thing with haters. Right. It's all, so so it's, basically, you're saying that philosophically, you cannot trick based on the, the, the platform that you have created over these last 30 years. It has nothing to do with the music. It just has to do with my preference. I don't, okay. I don't really want paid for a pussy. I, I was told to go to certain places. I'm not going to blast out any countries or any cities, but they're like, man, go there. And it's so inexpensive. And the women are so fine. I can think of two places in particular. They say, go. And I'm like, perhaps if I was there, and you was like, those two bitches right there, well, you can have them for the weekend for a hundred dollars. I'm like, uh, okay, like fuck, that's I'm gonna spend a hundred dollars buying drinks. Yeah. So whatever, man. I'm, I mean, enjoy life. So if you enjoying life that way, I've had guys tell me like we hanging out, we like real players, we ballers, and I had dudes say, man, I don't feel like all that talking you doing, making her laugh and smile, and she like you, like, I don't want her to like me. I don't want to fucking make her laugh and smile. How much? Like, cut the fucking chase. So it take you an hour, two hours, three hours. It take me three minutes, and she's, the deal's done, stuck in my dick. So I get, if that's that guy's preference. Right. But just know that that female might not be keeping that money for herself. She might go home and give it to her dude. That makes you a trick. Regardless. There you go. Broken down in the best way that I've ever seen it broken down. Before. It's cool, though. It's cool. Yeah. Well, you had a situation with a, a sexual assault lawsuit? Uh, yes. 
This is exactly what it is. <laughs> right. And uh, I guess you have actually countersued. Well, you have to countersue when people start lying about your name in publications and shit like that. But uh, the bad part about my situation was when the story goes out and you grab it from somewhere else, somebody plays with the words and they leave out certain things that should be like, this is not a criminal case. You know what I'm saying? So accused of sexual assault does not mean LAPD accused you of sexual assault. It's a civil that means suit. a person yeah, accused a, you. It means it's a civil well, suit. They in want, my case, they want some money out of you. In my case, it was on Instagram. Somebody was on their Instagram saying, uh, "Too short did this to me. Too short did this to me. Too short did this to me." And TMZ ran a story saying um, that he's being investigated. So I called myself to find out about this investigation. Mm -hmm. Did not exist. I've never been contacted. I've never been arrested. I've never been charged with anything. So I, when I called to find out, I say, am I being investigated? Is this, can I come down to you and talk about this? They were like, you're not under any investigation. So shortly after that, the Me Too movement gets real hot. And I'm not saying this, this person was jumping on a bandwagon, but right when it went Me Too, Me Too, then the shit resurfaced as a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit. So then the story re resurfaces, allegations, allegations accused of, but it keeps, the headline keeps leaving out the part that this is not a criminal case. So in the meantime, a story that rises to the surface twice, each time we talking like the loss of like hundreds of thousands of dollars for the people that backed out of the stuff that was on the table as far as certain shows, certain business deals, things that had a lot of potential, a lot of money. And right. plus your lawyer fees, the lawyer fees so far are like 50 grand so far. Yep. And that's just a lot of loss and a lot of spending yep. for, you know, untruth. So right. It, and most times the accuser will have a lawyer on contingency. The, so the, that, the lawyer is definitely free. Exactly. So it doesn't cost them anything. Mm -mm. The lawyer the will probably have spent a little bit of money, a little bit of time, whatever. But essentially all the costs put on you. And you know this, <laughs> so yeah. so it's a it's a pain in the ass. I just got through telling you that I feel like the culture is changing for the better. The culture of men and women in the workplace. I hate that I was a part of this change, but I, at the same time, I do also admit that I had discussions with females who were explaining to me the levels of of. Um, inappropriate the levels of harassment that they experience it's not it's not just rape there's so many different levels of uncomfortable yeah. and i have to say that over the years i've been one of those guys with the lions and the babies and the whistles and the shit you know just it was it was how we were taught but you know the art of fucking has changed <laughs> I mean, before this situation, have you had women accuse you of stuff or try to file charges? Before this situation, I've been in rooms where guys were being too aggressive with females, and I'm like, whoa, bro, she's not feeling you. Like, like, stop. Like, I've I, I defused shit, like, many times. Like, it, it just ain't going down like that around me, man. You're not going to sit here and, 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 and buck up on a chick that ain't feeling you. So um, I've, I've never been into My dick won't even get hard if I got to pin you down. Yeah, right. If you say stop, that dick is like, like I'm not participating yeah, with you. I, I'm exactly the same way. Matter of fact, if I fuck all that stop shit, if I notice that the woman's not enjoying herself, yeah, I, I can't keep my erection. I have to be turned on. Yeah, I have to feel like she's and getting turn me on. You got to participate. So right, like, exactly. So if I if you if you just a stiff fuck, I probably would fake it, <laughs> fake a nut and and just be like, you, oh, that was good. You fake nuts before? Well, I would fake a nut just by stopping. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've said many reasons that, like that's that's a pimp thing though man you like fucking the shit out of a girl and you just fucking stop mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like what the fuck are you doing I'm like I gotta do some shit <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot I have a lot a lot of a lot, lot of things of, going lot on too, right a lot now. of too short isms you know you've dropped tons of songs tons hundreds maybe thousands maybe thousands but there's one song that was your biggest song ever what do you think that is blow the whistle I don't know if Blow the Whistle was the biggest song. I think it was the most timeless song. I think it had the longest lifespan because it's still alive right now. But when it, the, as far as like radio impact and 
and just uh, driving album sales. Mm -hmm. Songs like Life Is Too Short, The Ghetto, those are much bigger records for me. Like, okay. like send me out on tours, world tours and shit like that. Uh, Blow the Whistle was this little song that wasn't a big hit when it came out. It just always, people just always liked it. And it hit the dance floor and it's just a go-to. It's, it's a go-to like DJs are like, this song is in my playlist. I don't, I don't get what makes a record timeless, but I'm glad I got one finally. Does Blow the Whistle mean blow job? It means a lot of things. It's a... What did you mean it to be? The song is a sports metaphor. Okay. Blow the whistle. It's talking about people getting too high, people trying to do shit they ain't got no business doing in life. You trying to you stunt too hard or something. And it's like in the game, they throw the fucking flag or they blow the whistle, call the penalty, whatever the fuck. You know mm. what I'm saying? Call foul. And if you listen to the song, there, there are multiple like little sports metaphors. I do a lot of little adding up math and shit. And then, and then, um, uh, some somebody came along later and said blow the whistle means suck my dick and i'm like i listened to the song i'm like yeah pretty good much it pretty much could mean that too so okay but i didn't write it as a suck my dick song i wrote it as a as just a you know you foul you, you're taking too many drugs you're partying okay. too hard you can't do the shit that some other people can do so right stay in your lane after doing stay on the porch after doing a ton of Suck My Dick songs, the one song that wasn't a Suck My Dick song became a Suck My Dick song. Yeah, I have a thing I do when I write songs. I um, I try to say these blatant things, like, okay, like this, take Suck My Dick. Now, I would write on a piece of paper, Suck My Dick, and then on a line, I try to figure out how many different ways can I say that and make you know what I mean without saying Suck My Dick. So it could be like, lick it, uh, uh, kiss on it, um, you know, you just, I just would we'll be writing forever. And then I put those in songs and shit. So I've, I've, I've done that with a lot of phrases, but suck my dick is one of the, the favorite ones. And you can, you can say suck my dick a hundred different ways. Do you think that the Jay-Z jumping on that beat, you know, and doing his it own gave freestyle, it a whole life. was that just a total game changer, you think? I think that was the last frontier of where the song was going to go. Mm -hmm. And... Had he not done that, it might not have gone there, which was East Coast and beyond from that angle. So from that New York starting to like it, that gives it a, a whole new branch. And then, um, you know, people will play Jay-Z's verse. The best thing that happened for me was Jay-Z, he did a remix. But the best thing that happened was they doubled back and would play Jay's, one of Jay's verse and one of my verses. So that was like, okay, I'm getting... A bunch of DJs that would have never played this mm -hmm. are now playing. They like to play my verse because the crowd goes BS, and they play the J verse because there's J, you know. So, you know, Drake essentially referenced, you know, mm -hmm. basically redid Khaled. the lyrics. Let's say Khaled. Okay, Khaled, but it was mm -hmm. Drake actually rapping. <laughs> <laughs> this Khaled song. You're right. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Fuck me for free. Um, you know, well, we, I had a song called Don't Fuck For Free way back in the day. Yeah. Drake's song was called For Free, yeah. but then he sampled Blow The Whistle and yeah. said some of the lines from Blow The Whistle, and it's like, I, I don't know if his For Free title... Oh, was based on your... I don't even know if he knows I had a song called Don't Fuck For Free, but maybe he did, because Drake, he, he's... He's, um, he's, a, he's a historian. He did one thing that I thought was pretty clever, and I say that I've been rapping for 225,000 hours. And he said 223,000 hours. So you know what that is, right? Mm -mm. He's too short, 2,000 short, too short. That's, that's the huh. 223,000, 225,000. Okay. I'm like, why did he say 223? He changed that one line, because too short. Too short. 2,000 short, man. Clever, clever. At least that's how I took it. You know, if you look at all the lyrics you've ever done, because you know, I, I've interviewed some artists and, we, and I've referenced some of the stuff that they've, they've said before, mm -hmm. and they've literally asked me to take that part out of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about who, who it was uh, off camera. But, like, you had, I forgot what song it was, but you had a song that said, uh, Nancy Reagan came mm -hmm. to my house. Gave me a blowjob. Keep going? 
she licked my dick up and down like it was corn on the cob. Right. And, and, was, and, and Ronald Reagan was president at that time. She was the first lady when I said She was that. the first lady. Yeah. You were talking about the first lady sucking your dick like corn on the cob. It was all shock value. It was like um, Ronald Reagan was taking away programs and shit in the inner city. He was like cleaning house on, on Jimmy Carter, you know, and fucking, um, it, it was, it was kind of Trump-ish right now, hmm. this, the sentiment. We were kind of- I, I, I see what you're saying, the 80s with yeah, Reagan, it was, yeah. it was kind of feeling a little Trump-ish. Yeah, you're right. We call it the Reagan era, Reaganomics, all this shit. And it was yeah. like, shit changed in the streets, man, it changed. And, you know, we're just jabbing back a little bit. Yeah, that's all. So was there any pushback over those lyrics or lyrics like that? For some reason, I remember this, the Reverend Calvin Butt steamrolling cassette yeah. tapes and shit. I remember Two Live Crew and the Ghetto Boys in court. I remember- yeah, I just interviewed Willie D about that. The people who's, who were at the stores, the clerks, they were getting arrested for selling the music if they tried to sell the music. They used to keep our music behind the counter. Hmm. And so, yeah, all of that, that labeling, you know, with the, the whole, when you see the parental advisory sticker, you know, you can thank, you know, two live crew and ghetto boys for that. NWA too, you know, you can thank us. <laughs> and Ice T and Too Short. I remember the FBI contacting NWA, and mm -hmm. I don't know what was, was, uh, no, what was, uh, what, I don't know why I was, I was not a part of any of that. Something that I did, either my nonchalant demeanor or the fact that uh, I really didn't have like radio hits that were like threatening. My, all my radio songs are like the positive songs. Yeah. Like somehow they missed me. Like I, when Kelvin Butts was running over CDs, cassettes, I didn't see a two shirt cassette down there. Like I'm like, do they know? Remember Tipper Gore, Tipper Gore was, yeah. was had a list of names. I was never on that list. Uh, C. Dolores Tucker. They never, none of them never, ever knew you, about you. You managed short. to just stay under the radar of all that. Huh, interesting. I don't know. How did it feel to, to watch Black Panther and hear your song playing? Well, you know, the movie comes on and the very first thing you hear is Too Short. And the, the song was? In the trunk. In the trunk, right. I mean, I get the gist of it because, you know, the director's from Oakland. That probably was, he was about that age. Mm -hmm. When that song was out, and he's like, I'm a, he, wrote, he wrote some personal shit in there. And he wrote the, he wrote the city in the, in the, just because that's where he's from. Like, he, he found a way to make to, Oakland. To put Oakland into Black into Panther. Into the Black Panther story. Yeah, that, right. was, <laughs> that was dope. So, yeah, that is. And what, else, what, are, you, what are you going to do? Start with a two short song. You know what I'm saying? So, I, uh, I was told I had a song in the movie, but I wasn't told it was the first song. Mm. I was very shocked when I saw it. And that's one of the, um, those moments where, you know, you know, that song, luckily, because a few of my songs have been samples, but in a moment like that, he picked a song that was an original. Mm. So that was like, thank you. So you own the publishing and everything in that song? That's our, yeah, of course. We wrote the music, me, uh, Shorty B, uh, probably Ant Banks, I don't know who I was in on it. So that was a nice check. It, it it comes in, you know. It comes in the in the whole thing. Yeah, you know, but, you just don't get a check. Like Black Panther sent you a check. It just, oh, there's not like an upfront for them even using it. It, it comes. No, I didn't. I didn't get upfront. For okay, it. but I well, didn't, would you want it? You I just want to be in. You just want to be in the arena, bro. You know, I feel you. And and, and at the end of the day, it's like that they probably was, paid a licensing fee to get it or yeah. all that shit but still I, that's all, what I'm saying the beautiful part is we wrote that music yeah and the publishing so that's that's a beautiful thing and and you know black panther was the biggest budget black movie ever right if you really think about it the probably, biggest budget black movie of all biggest, time biggest grossing too yeah and biggest grossing mm -hmm. and you know and then like it was the first movie to be played in Saudi Arabia in like 20 years or something like that. Damn, you, you heard about know, that? Didn't know all that. You can't play movies in Saudi Arabia. It's like outlawed. Black and they, Panther. and they broke that rule to play Black Panther. That was the first film they played in movie theaters in it's decades. Dope. It's dope. And they got to hear too short. Why do they have theaters? <laughs> you didn't I watch don't know. movies. I don't know. Propaganda maybe. <laughs> like what's in the theaters? I don't know. That's a whole other story. That's a whole other story. 
You and Pimp C were close. Very close. Very close. Mm -hmm. um, I, I interviewed uh, Bun B recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told the story about how uh, Tupac almost, you know, almost stopped Pimp C from doing uh, Big Pimping. Tupac was already dead at that time, right? So Pimp okay, used yeah. to, in 2000, Pimp, uh, Tupac was dead. Pimp used to have a picture on his wall of Tupac. And whenever you would ask him something that required deep thought, he would look at the picture. And we'd be like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm asking Pac what he think. He was very, very aligned in with the personality of Tupac, not really the musician, but the character of Tupac, the personality and how he carried himself as a man in the world and in the culture. And if it was something that Pimp thought that Tupac wouldn't do, Pimp wouldn't do it. Well, I do remember him saying, my ears hearing Pimp C say, I ain't fucking with nobody that didn't fuck with Tupac. So that was his, one of his reasons why he wasn't gonna do the record with, with Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. He's like, he ain't fuck with Tupac, I don't fuck with him. Like he just, that was a rule, huh. period. Yeah, I mean, Bun B basically said that that was like one of the only times he saw Pimp compromise about his principles. Cause he didn't really, he did not want to do the song and Bun got him to do eight bars basically. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally delivered Pimp C to the video shoot. Like if you, <laughs> If you look at the video shoot, there's okay. a scene, a lot of scenes in the video where they're at this carnival. I think they were in Trinidad or something. Yeah. Pimp C didn't make it to the airport or whatever the fuck, he didn't go. Bun B is in that part. And then there's another shoot that's at this house. Wasn't Pimp C, he was like with a Mercedes? And like, yeah, he had just got the car. Gloria Velez or something, or something that yeah, looked he like had, her? He, they put him in the scene, him and Gloria standing okay, by the car, yeah. but I literally, we were in Atlanta, and this big budget video is going down, and he's not there, so I literally, <laughs> He was proud of his new Mercedes, and I had just bought like this little Porsche, and I'm like, bro, let's just drive down to Miami. You got it, like, like the, the song had already been done. It was already moving around hot, and I'm like, you got to do this, man. You got to do this, like literally. So I got him on the highway, and we did like a little road trip. It's a nice little little ride from a like not, nice little nine hours or something. I don't know how far yeah. from Atlanta to Miami, and we jumped on the highway and we drove down, and we just we sh he shot the video. We hung out for about two weeks out there, and. That was one of the best, that, that might be the best time we ever had. Yeah, like just h hanging out with homies. Yeah, yeah. I hung out with Pimp C a week before he died for the first time, first mm -hmm. and only time. Yeah, he was out here in L.A. Yeah, yeah. he was in L.A. Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, Rick Martin, was uh, managing him, and uh, that was a funny motherfucker, man. Yeah, he, 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 he could take over the room. He could tell stories. No, he no, was, he took over. Yeah, exactly. He he took over the room. No one said shit. Well, while he told story after story. Pimp C. Uh, like I, I was not, I was not wise to uh, how to, like I still, I still don't know how to dance around it. You know the whole click, clickbait thing, how not to say shit that ends up in headlines. It's, it's an art to it that I really haven't perfected. But Pimp C would have never went for it. He would have been, he would have been the king of clickbait. He would have gave you so many <laughs> gems. Yeah, I was so supposed many. to, I was actually supposed to interview him, but he didn't have his haircut, so he wasn't <laughs> gonna do it. <laughs> You know, it's really too bad. Um, when you got the phone call, when you got the phone call uh -huh. about Pim passing, uh, how bad did it hit you? Uh, well, his mother called me. I saw Pimp Saturday night. He came to the House of Blues. I did the show. I talked to him Sunday. We were going to do dinner, and neither one of us was, the timing wasn't right. We were like, let's just do it up tomorrow or something. And then no hear from him on Monday. And his mama called me early Tuesday morning and said, asked me, like, you know, seen him, you talked to him. I've been, she's like, she said, we talk every day. And I didn't talk to him yesterday. And now I haven't talked to him this morning. Mm -hmm. She's like, he's staying at such and such hotel. Get over there and go find out what the fuck happened. And I couldn't even get dressed fast enough when she called me back and said they found him in his room. So I, I just, to me, it's been 10 years. And I'm like, it just, it, that's just one of those ones like somebody's really close to you and you don't get the answers you want and you're like, well, like what the fuck happened? So to me, it's always been that what the fuck happened. And I was told something about a combination of sleep apnea and something and he died in his sleep or something. I, that's what I was told. Yeah. I mean, Bun said that when he got locked up, he gained a lot of weight. Yeah. A lot of weight because he basically just sat around eating the whole time. You yeah. know, I mean, he wasn't. He did come out of, out of jail big. 
Yeah, and um, you know, between that and and the lean use, you know, it was it was a sad a sad situation because he was such a talent. Yeah, well, you know, that was my little brother, man, and uh, some people you don't want to let go. Uh, Tupac was hard to let go of. Biggie was hard to let go of. You know, we we just we just feel cheated, man. We feel like I needed more of that. You know, like yeah. what was to come. Like like Pimp was just he was just really hitting that gear from being released from jail. He was right. I mean, uh, International Players Anthem was nominated for a Grammy. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, it, it was like he was popping. Like you know right. what I mean. And he was making headlines with with his shit talking and yeah, but, man. A man went out on top of the game, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, R.I.P. to the pimp. That's, what, that's what we say. Now, you knew Tupac as well? I knew Tupac pretty good, man. We didn't run the streets together, but Tupac ran with a lot of my homies. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a little older, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, what do you think was the most memorable moment you've had with Tupac? I just, I see how Tupac is portrayed in movies mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, the different, like, Tupac styles like 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 they did him in the Biggie movie where he's all loud shirts and walking walking all over exaggerated. I the one thing I always remember about Tupac is that he would be these different Tupacs when you saw him from time to time. Mm -hmm. Like he'd be the wise Tupac and talking like some, you know, some introspective uh intelligent shit. Then he'd be a militant. Then he'd be fucking party Tupac with some Hennessy and a cigarette and a blunt all at the same time. And then he'd be in the studio fucking like Tupac the crazy rapper that writes raps faster than everybody else. And he just, it just was, you know. Um, but every time he would like he would be around, you would you would know. Tupac was one of those people like Pimp C who kinda commanded the room to pay attention to them. He he, you know, the bitches wanted Tupac, the, everybody wanted to be his homie and shit, like that type of shit. And uh, I even have a, um, a old VHS, uh, when he, we used to do the little one hour something to go with the, each album. Mm -hmm. So mine for, I, I don't know if it's Life is Too Short or Short Dog Time. One of them, one of those, I did one for Shorty the Pimp, Life is Too Short. Uh, I think we got a little little DVD for every album. Mm -hmm. And one of those, Shock G was the host of my party that I'm doing on the in the tape. Mm -hmm. And I noticed uh, on playback years later that it, Money B and, and Tupac is in the background. Just like little, they're like little little dudes. Yeah. And it was Shock G was popping, Digital Underground was popping. But the first, 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 Digital Underground look, it was more like Shock Humpty Hump. And remember uh, the Humpty Dance, Money B and Tupac was like the dancers and yeah, shit. Yeah, exactly. So it was that Tupac. But he's in the back, animated than a motherfucker. I'm like, that's Tupac. Well, we just found out that Kim Porter died yeah, today. Man, and you actually knew her. Been knowing her for a long, long time, man. Back in Atlanta, long before, you know, the Puff Daddy and all that. Just, you know, just my friend Kim, you know. She's like really, really close with close friends of mine. Like really close. 47 years old. Yeah, I'm a, I, I, just, I just got this, so it's not really like processing right now. And, you know, we get older, we lose people, man. But, you know, 47, man, 47, man, damn. 47, three kids. You know, how old were her twins? Four kids. Oh, four kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, she has three kids with, with Puffy. Yeah. Oh, and then Quincy yeah. with Al B. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. So sad. Yeah, I love Kim, man. She was um, she was real good people, man. Real good people, for yeah. real, for real. Yeah. Damn, I'm just thinking about all, all the fam, man. Like, damn. Yeah, people are, are are crying right now. Puffy, Puffy, I'm sure is is bawling right now. Um, her kids, everyone, man. Yeah, I just had uh, Tamla Jones on here, and and I, you know, after we cut off the camera, I pulled out my phone, and I'm like, yo, Kim Porter just that. She's like. I went to her baby shower. Like this was my friend. Like it was, Tamla, it was, that's the homie, man. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what happened. Uh, nobody knows what happened. Uh, as you get older, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, you know, you can't. You know, you have to slow down and you have to think long term. You know, um, especially when you have families and a lot of people that really. You got to live that life too, bro. You got to live it, man. I, I'm. I'm a firm believer in. 
and living that life. And uh, we lost her, but I know for a fact she was living that life. Now she know? was. So she was, man, up until the end. How well do you know MC Hammer? How well do I know MC? Hammer? Yeah, because you and MC Hammer came up around the same time. I yeah, think I, was, I think Hammer came a little after you. I was in the streets before Hammer, as far as like the music and stuff. Yeah, I was um, making records before Hammer. But he came very shortly after and did big things. And I've always been an admirer of Hammer because of the way he did it. We were at odds, so to speak, at a at a young time. But it wasn't like it wasn't like violence or anger. It was more like just you know the local competition. Yeah. And you know Hammer was he was a big dog man. He got respect in the streets. He had, came from a respected crew. And they handled business, him and his brother Lewis and, all, and the crew. And, you know, when we saw each other, it was respect and love. And then, you know, when we weren't around each other, he'd take little jabs and talk shit. But it was, it was that type of shit. Yeah, because I just interviewed uh, MC Search from Third mm -hmm. Base. Well, he, tell, he tell you some gangster stories on Hammer. Well, he, he basically told the whole story about how he feels MC Hammer put a $50,000 hit on him. Pete said the line that really pissed Hammer off about, you know, Cactus turned Hammer's mother out. Um, and that was the one that really, that really took Hammer over, over, the, over, the, over the edge. But the whole genesis of it for me was twofold. One, he wouldn't battle me, which is petty, but I was, you know, I was 19 years old. Like, so in my, my mentality and how we looked at how we dealt with things in hip hop, you battle. That's not his culture. It's not where he comes from. And even if it is, what does he have to prove to me? I wouldn't agree to that, but I would say um, without spending any money, Hammer could have told some people to fuck him the fuck up. Like, like that wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have, I know who Hammer was affiliated with and he wouldn't have to pay to get, to tell somebody to fuck somebody up. His people would just do it. We from Oakland. Like you don't even, he wouldn't even have to say it. They just, right. but if, this, if somebody was making Hammer uncomfortable, without him saying I'm uncomfortable, somebody around him would have came to you and said, Quit making Hammer uncomfortable. <laughs> right. It, it would have been like like a, a a no negotiable statement. Right. It started from a line they had on on the Cactus album where mm -hmm. they said the Cactus turned Hammer's mother's out. Uh, the Cactus turned Hammer's mother out, mm -hmm. which was a reference to their album, the Cactus, and turn this mother out. Mm -hmm. But you know he took it as it wasn't a, personal. He they were t you know Hammer took it as they're talking about my mother. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't about his mom. It was just clever wordplay and you know, hey man at, at the Probably around that time, I don't know when that happened, but Hammer used to, uh, people used to like test them a little bit and just to see if he was, you know, dancing Hammer. And a few times in life, you know, I've heard people tell stories like they caught the wrath of MC Hammer Ain't No Punk. Uh, Red Man. Yeah, they caught it. Red Man caught it from Hammer. And actually, he said he apologized to Hammer when he saw him. Listen to my first album when I did the skit, and I was like, you know what? That goddamn MC Hammer, fuck him, fuck his mama and the whole nine. That nigga came up to me on MTV Cribs on the last episode they had where everybody out on, not MTV Cribs, sorry about that, I'm zone. Um, on the last uh, Dr. Dre and Ed Lover uh, on MTV when they had the last episode. Yo, yo MTV Raps. Yeah, your MTV Raps. When the last episode they shot when they had everybody rapping on it, MC Hammer was there. That nigga approached me. He was like, Red. I'm gonna tell you something, you young, but I don't allow nobody talking about my mama. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> because, yo, we was already in Oakland with EPMD, and we damn near had to bounce up out of there for that. Because they had niggas back here, back here, back here. We had to get the fuck out of here. They wasn't playing. If you just take away the fucking pants and the dancing and just focused on the people that wasn't on stage, <laughs> when the crew walk up, don't look at the dancers, look at the other dudes. You would have figured that shit out. Right, because we had just posted a picture up. I got it off Snoop's page, and it had a picture of Snoop, Tupac, and MC Hammer together, mm -hmm. you know, wearing suits. And I said, who's the most gangster out of these three? And everyone was putting <laughs> MC Hammer in the comments. Like, hey, look at this. Um, <laughs> Hammer was coming off a tour. Some stuff had happened. I can't give you the specifics, but... Some stuff had happened that was like some real life shit. Could have been shootings, could have been stuff, stuff had happened out on the tour. And I was um, 
kicking up some dust at home, you know, like a little propaganda, you know, like trying to be mad at Hammer for some, some shit he said in interviews and, you know, just, 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 just our, our local rivalry. And it wasn't ever going to be because his crew was cool with my crew. Wasn't ever going to be violence, but it was like shit talking could, could possibly motivate some goofy fan to do something on my behalf or something, whatever it could be. But I got a call from Louis Burrell, Hammer's big brother, and he was like, look, man, he was matter of fact. He was like, we've been out on this road. We've been going through some shit, and we're on our way home. He was like, we don't want to come home to some shit, short. So he was basically saying, whatever the fuck you own, we're tired, bro. Like, don't, we're not, we're not, we, it's just, it's not happening. And I was like, I get it, I get it, because I knew what they had been going through. And I think that was probably where our whole little, little unwritten feud, our, our unadvertised feud kind of just went away because it was like, this shit is way realer than what we doing right here. This, this other shit y'all going through is way realer. So. Right, because after I did the search interview and he mentioned his brother was the one that like, you know, he claimed that his brother called and said, yeah, you know, they're dead or whatever else. And everyone, as I started reading the comments and getting the backstories, Everything was kind of pointing to his brother to, as being kind of like, sort of like the gangster in that crew. He played he played that part. Yeah. But even him, uh, you know, uh, Oakland is a, a different kind of place, man. You, you, I line you, I, I'll line you ten Oakland dudes up in a row, and I bet you couldn't pick out the most violent one. Like hmm. you, you just couldn't do it. You just, you probably, I don't know what you would base it on, but I'm sure you you pick wrong. <laughs> right. Well, the, the little dudes are usually the, the scariest ones. It's just that very, in our town, it's just you, you never know who. You just fucking never know who. Easy e mm -hmm. took you on his first tour, I guess? Straight out of Compton. He, Straight out of Compton tour. He personally, I got the call from Easy. Easy, I want you to go on tour with me. Like, like so. Because um, he was a fan. We had the hottest singles out on the West Coast at the same time. Freaky Tales and Boys in the Hood mm, were right. out at the exact same You're time. Right. That would have been, you know, 88. And then they they made Straight Outta Compton and it came out, the, it just came out smoking hot. Yeah, Life Is Too Short came out right and after I came that. Out, I dropped yeah. Life Is Too Short and they're like, you know, pretty much was a no brainer. Like, like let's grab that guy and go. Right. But it did, I was not as big of an artist going on that tour as I was, com as I was coming off that tour. Hmm. When I went on the tour, I had sold about 300,000 records. It was my first time doing big numbers. Uh, when I, as I was on the tour, I sold another 500,000 copies on tour. Mm. And then when I got back off tour, uh, you know, we had no social media, so the rumors went out. Rumors, remember those? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> Too sure got killed. <laughs> yeah, they said I got shot in the head right. in the crack house, and I yeah. sold another 500,000 records on, <laughs> on like dead vigils and shit. And so, you know, I always gave Easy E a lot of credit for putting me on that platform, that stage that got me to be a platinum artist. Right, and you guys were actually pretty close. You would hang out a lot. Yeah, we would do the after the show shit and move around. You know, um, I don't really remember Dr. Dre ever really liked after partying it up with us, like, you know, the, but mm -hmm. Easy was about that life. He was like, you know, either if he, if he was gonna be, he was either gonna be fucking some bitches or look where we going, you know? Well, look how many kids he had. Easy liked the fuck. I, I'm assuming he really liked the fuck. <laughs> and he didn't use condoms. He talked about, you know, in a, in a Howard Stern interview, he said he don't use condoms. Okay, I didn't, I didn't see that interview, but at the same time, uh, he fucked a lot of, he, he well, was. Look, look how many kids he had. Like, in fact, new kids pop up. I mean, like, <laughs> all the time. Like, I interviewed Lil Easy, and he told me about some new brother he found out about recently oh, man. that has the same name as one of his other kids. I guess there's, like, another Eric. There's, like, two Erics. I looked at his picture, and I was like, wow. His name said Eric Wright. So, you know, it was a long story. Um, you know, his mom kind of just vanished off, went to Memphis, you know what I mean? So he lives in Memphis. You know, he's originally from uh, Inglewood, so uh, just vamped off when he was young. And he just wanted to reach out. He's a truck driver. Just wanted to reach out to before his mom passed away to get closure to his family. So it was kind of touching, you know what I mean? And it was cool, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It just kind of, you know, it was got to get that brother vibe real, real quick, you know what I mean? So you know that was an extra addition to my father's family, kids. So Easy had two sons named Eric. Real talk, 
Real talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's most pretty definitely. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when you really think about it. Yes, most definitely. Eric yeah. one and Eric two. Uh huh. Really, really. Okay, you were the first Eric. Most born, first born. You put out there what you want. So one of Easy E's most famous lines was, he he let the girls on the you know the song. Uh, was it Easy Does It or one of them? I don't know. And it, and it goes, uh, we want to fuck you, Easy. He like, I want to fuck, fuck you, you too. too. That was, he ran that shit. That was a big part of the show because he the music dropped. All the ladies in the crowd going, fuck. And then he would, uh, he would say in a part of in his show, he would say the name of the hotel very nonchalantly. He was like, yeah, you know, we was over at the Marriott across the street. Everybody's coming to the Marriott after the show. Like, like Easy was, he was a, a real player. Well, you don't believe that he died from AIDS? I don't, because of, you know, just conspiracies and... As much as he was fucking and he wasn't using condoms, because you could tell with all the kids, like, you know what I mean? As much as he was fucking, he was fucking all the groupie chicks that were fucking everybody else. It's not, it's not about did he contract AIDS from a female or something. It was just about the disease and... You know, he, at the, at the stage where people start being affected by AIDS and things start breaking down, there's a deterioration period that you go through. Well, he was sick for a while. He, he had like a, you know, like a pneumonia kind of thing going on for a while. And then they slid him into this induced coma and then he slips away and shit. And it's like... You know, people hang on for a long time, and they hang, they don't go. Not back. back then, they didn't. There was no, there was no, you know, combination drugs and cocktails and shit like that. That came later. I just feel like uh, I have my conspiracy theories, man. You know, <laughs> and you're sticking to them. Yeah, man. You know, <laughs> nothing I can say. Is George going. George Bush Senior was mad at him. The FBI was mad at him. You remember he went to the White House dinner? Yeah. And then he he kind of made fun of it a little bit after the fact. Mm -hmm. Like, George Bush Sr. was the head of the CIA before he was yeah. vice president. And, and, and later on president. If he wanted to knock you down, he could knock you down with suicide, cancer, AIDS, car wreck, heart attack. Yeah, I just don't think easy was a priority on, on George Bush Sr.'s list, you know? <laughs> but also, he was the leader of the group that was influencing white kids to use the N-word and fuck, fuck the police. Fuck the police. He, was, yeah. he was, he was, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And as you look at Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and what was their, what was the reason why you wanted them dead? They would, what, what was the reason why they would want to, anybody would want them dead? Is because they had a large audience and mm -hmm. they were saying shit that somebody didn't want them to say. That's what Biggie did, that's what Tupac did, that's what Easy did, that's what Pimp C did. Yeah, you I'm, not, that, I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy. You talk that politi that shit that affects politics. I, I try to connect the dots. You know what I mean? Like, well, man, you fuck. You probably the same guy who will sit here and go, every fucking politician that died, like mysteriously, it was justified. Every goddamn heart attack, plane crash, and fucking car crash and suicide was exactly what it was. I mean, do you know how many people think that that Suge set up Tupac to get killed? Do you know this is really a thing right now, in 2018? I know you don't believe that. Because I believe Tupac didn't die. Really? <laughs> you think Tupac's still alive? For real, yeah. for real. Vlad believes everything he reads. <laughs> no, I don't believe everything I read, but I actually interview people around the situation. Uh, okay, that's cool. You interview people that seen the dead body, all that. That's cool. <laughs> you, you must live with your truth. Right, but so I'm you, telling you. You believe Tupac's alive right now. I'm just saying that every politician did not die of fucking car, the car crash. There, then some of them motherfuckers got killed. Okay, fair enough. Some of them plane crashes were deliberate. Okay. So spill the shit over in the hip hop, man. It, it, is, it is a possibility. Okay, we'll leave it at that. It ain't, <laughs> believe me, it ain't just open and shut, bro. Did you know Suge? Yes, I know Suge. I like he's not gone. I know Suge. Well, I mean, he's he's sitting down <laughs> like, for a did, while. Did you know him? <laughs> well, I, I I assume that you guys aren't. I know Shug. close at this yeah. very moment. <laughs> I was I was closer than you think. I was actually uh, I spent five weeks up there in the L.A. County Jail in summer of 2015 when Suge first got up there. Oh, really? And yeah, I seen him quite a few times up in there. So okay, did you know him before then also? Yeah. Okay, so you know him for some years. But they actually used to have me 
my little five weeks in there, I get vi visitors on Saturday, and they, every time, I don't know if they, if that was by design, if they planned it, they, was, they would make my visit be right next to his, like you're in this little booth kind of, mm -hmm. and they put me next to him every time. So he like Probably two high profile guys, you know. But at the same time, every time, but you know, get a couple words in, ask about some friends, I'm like, what's up, what's up, you know, just chop it up, and then we ignore each other because we're gonna talk to our families. How did you feel when he got the 28 years? Well, a lot of people go, "What's it? What? What? What is a 28 year plea deal like? That's like that you when you when you get 28 years, you kind of fighting that shit. You know, just plea 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 bargain for that. But especially when you're 50 something. Yeah, but I guess he was tired, man. I don't know. I just I I just know I've been in that building, man. And it's it's he been in that building what five fucking years or something like three three four, three years. Well. I talked to Reggie Wright Jr., who was the head of Death Row Security, mm -hmm. and he stayed in contact with Suge this whole time. The way he explained it. What he pretty much explained or said was he would have had to win six times to not get life in jail. Win six times? Because there were six different charges? It was three different charges, but he would have had to beat those twice because they would have kept retrying him. Well, in hindsight, you look back in the law and you think about what could have been done different and people got all this stuff. Well, you should have called the police immediately. You should have not left the scene. All, all this stuff that, you know, but man, in the, in the moment, you don't know what you would do. So, you know, I don't wish 20 years in jail on anybody. And, you know, a lot of people are celebrating that and a lot of people are sad about that. But... You know, it's a, it's, a thought, it's a shame to see a brother do so good and go from, you know, 400 million to 20 years. That's, that's, that's not something to celebrate with a guy, with a mean, guy like me. I thought he was going to get off, honestly. I thought that you could argue for a self-defense. Yeah, I also thought that in that one case, there was some area of outside of not calling you know, like when you left the scene, you're supposed to call and say someone was injured mm -hmm. or something, something, you just say it, whether you leave it or not, say it, do, do that part. But I thought that he did have some room in there to, to, to play the fear thing. I was scared for my life. And, but then, like, as you said, there was five other cases waiting, so. Well, th two other cases with okay. potential appeals. Okay, okay. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, man, Suge was the boogeyman of hip hop. Yeah, I think, um, I think that his approach, probably, he was the, probably the last one that could do it like that. Because you probably had a lot, you know, like Big Red and uh, Five Heartbeats. Right. Yeah, a lot of Big Reds in the game. You know, people know the names. But I think that, you know, with the uh, uh, social media approaching, with the fascination of pop culture, like, you know, when Pac and Biggie died and the shit, it really was a shit after that. Mm -hmm. That he continued to be. I'm. I'm. And not, I'm not a music mogul. I'm a kingpin. And a music mogul. And it was like the industry. I feel like when he did the. Um, he had to go do the violation after Pac died. And mm -hmm. when he came out, it was a. It was a uphill battle for him because the industry was scared of him. But he still had all those cars. He had the building on Wilshire. He had a lot of shit. And. I just think it was a chess game from there. It had a lot of lawsuits and just things just, it was, it probably, there probably was a team of people that could have kept that together. Yeah. But, I, that, but it didn't happen. Yeah, I, Reggie told me that the reason why he really lost everything was that when he got out, he just wasn't dealing with the lawyers. The lawsuits. Yeah. yeah he and just and, all the and he ended up defaulting on a, on a suit because he didn't show up to court and the judge said $250 million. You're done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just for not showing up. Liquidated everything. Liquidated everything. Lost everything. Boom. And then he still kept the persona, yeah. which even at that point, there probably could have been ways to tuck shit away, you know, do yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, but even on top of that, like... Let's, let's just use MC Hammer, for instance. We, mm -hmm. we all felt like the story of hip-hop says MC Hammer went broke. But people who know Hammer know that's not true. That could have been the same story with Suge. Oh, Suge lost 400 million, but he wouldn't have lost everything. Man, everyone wanted to fuck with Suge. Like, 
you know, and people have asked me this all the time, like, oh, would you, would you do an interview with Suge? I'm like, no, I wouldn't. I've been in the same room with him. And when you, you get know? to the point where, and... Because, you know, and the thing is, would it be an incredible interview? Absolutely. But the persona and all the shit you hear about him makes people, professional people with money like myself say, not worth the trouble. You see what I'm saying? It, it was, but it was a lot of things, man. And I just, I feel like in hindsight, he probably looks back and, and goes, why did I keep pushing, pushing, pushing? You know, now we got the TMZ cameras all over Hollywood. We keep seeing Suge popping up in altercations right outside of venues and stuff. And even the night he got shot, he, they, they told him that he couldn't come in the club. Yeah. And he literally pushed him out the way. Yeah. And let himself in the club and went inside and got shot. And walked out with the bullets. Yeah, I mean, he was he was pressing people. That over. that is kind of boogie managed to say. He walked out. How many was it? Five bullets? Something like that. He walked out. Who the fuck can do that? Yeah, that's that's a lot. That's some Tupac shit right he there. He walked out. Yeah, and then went like sat down or something, waited on the ambulance. <laughs> like, like I, I, if I shot him. If I shot somebody five times and the motherfucker walked away from me, I would be like, what the <laughs> fuck just happened? What type of vampire is this? <laughs> I know the what fucking type bullets of in there. undead zombie in my yeah, that's, that's, right here. That's, that's, you know, the legend of Suge, man. I think that um, uh, the Suge Knight movie, I, 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 the ending, if it's like jail and all that, whatever, but not the ending. I'm just saying the Suge Knight movie of how he became Suge and, and what he did as Suge, it would be a great movie. Yeah, I mean, Death Row. Because his story is a different version of the NWA story. It's not the same story. And he, he did, no matter what you want to say, Harry O's involvement, Dr. Dre's contributions, uh, Easy e Whatever you want to say, Suge did put that fucking death row shit together, and that shit was fucking huge. He did do that. 100%. And that shit really happened, so. 100%. And the catalog is still amazing. The you impact is You huge. don't want to respect the journey. You got to respect that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. People are celebrating, and other people are, are mourning, but it just is what it is at this point. Yeah, man. I, I, I hope that... People learn from, you know, other people's mistakes, man. Like, you know, none of us, a lot, I mean, I never had an opportunity to touch 400 million building a, a record oh, label yeah. mogul shit. Like, that shit is, man, come on, that's Barry yeah. Gordy, bro. No, I, I think when you look at like a TDE, mm -hmm. you know, people like Top probably looked at the Death Row story and said, okay, here's what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Here's a blueprint that I could avoid because... From, he, the same, from the same city, you know? Same city. Yeah. You never hear of anyone getting beat up or drinking, I mean, look, look drinking at Dr. urine at TDE. Bro, look or, at Dr. Dre. How, how much credit do you give Dr. Dre for walking away? Just walking away from something that, that he, he like, that's, it's yours. And it's millions. And he's like, I don't want it. That. That's a very fucking large statement. That's a very fucking bold move. And that is, it had to be, it, that shit must have weighed so heavy on him to not want to be a part of that and to say, actually, I don't even want my share. That's deep. Yeah. Who would do that? Somebody who has a, a track record like Dr. Dre, who said, I could probably do it over and bigger. And he, and he did. Yeah, but who would, who would walk? Everybody would go do it bigger and better and still fight for what? Like, give me my shit too. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, though, Dre and Suge was not was not on on the same page at that point from everybody that I've talked to. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So so the whole thing of like, you know, like I remember I interviewed Michelle A. You know, who said, you know, we talked about the Suge situation, and she said Dre would never have, you know, because Suge said, oh, I had a meeting set up with Dr. Dre, and she said Dre would never have met Suge in Compton. Suge probably shouldn't have shown up to a place where Dr. Dre was. I, 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 Dr. Dre was there? Uh, he wasn't there, but the, the, the story, and I don't know how true the story is, but the alleged story was that 
Suge went there to try to talk to Dre because I guess Suge was being portrayed in the NWA movie, but he wasn't part of the movie and so forth. No? I can say this. Dr. Dre would have never met Suge Knight there. And I think that that was kind of the, the cusp of the story was you could say, well, self-defense, I just got beat up, I was trying to drive off. But you look at the whole situation and you say, Suge should not have been in Compton for the Straight Outta Compton you know, film set. Yeah. He was not invited. He was not a welcome participant. That's what I said with the hindsight. When he looks back, he could probably pinpoint those moments where, damn, I should have did like this. But, you know, man, I, 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 I got love for Suge, man. And I hope that, uh, you know, he gets through this shit, man. Like, no matter what the rest of his journey is, you know, it, 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 maybe he'll appeal something, get some time knocked off or something, something. You never know. The laws may change. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You just dropped album number 20, or 20-ish, mm. <laughs> like you said earlier. Yeah. But what's next for you? Uh, well, I'm following that up with a, um, I'm doing a series of albums. I'm not going to tell you the name of it right now, but there's a, uh, there's a, I'm dropping an album. I don't want to call it an album. I'm just dropping a bunch of songs. Probably in the tune of maybe like, a hundred or so songs throughout 2019. Mm. And they're uh, not all two short songs. They're just the songs that we make at my studio. I, I'm on probably like 25% of those songs. And I also, um, I have an album that follows the pimp tape. It's called The Last Tape. Now, without telling anybody what I was doing, at the end of last year, December 2017, I dropped a mixtape called Hella Disrespectful. Somewhere around February, March, maybe March, I dropped a little playlist, just a, just a little little songs, a teaser called the Sex Tape. Mm -hmm. Just recently, I dropped the Pimp Tape, and then two months from now, I'm dropping the Last Tape, and the Last Tape is all of those in one body of work, and it totals to about 50 songs. The Last Tape is pretty fucking dope, like, like. I'm not bragging on this album or even saying nothing. It's just something that's going to come out. And it's really, really, really some too short shit. Like the Pimp Tape is this polished body of work that we, we put in work and all these features. The last tape is like too short in the studio, just talking shit. It's really, like the music is really fucking fun. So, um, point made, there's a lot of music following up the Pimp Tape. And... I'm going to uh, just ride this 52-year-old wave, soon to be 53, and I'm just saying to hip-hop and for hip-hop, there is no definition. You can't define this shit. You can't build the box that hip-hop fits in and just put your hip-hop in and go, yeah, that's real hip-hop. That, that shit is dead, man. Mm -hmm. even, even like a lot of the shit you post with everybody, matter of fact, matter of fact, this, this, man, you motherfuckers are not defining hip-hop. You're not. The shit got out the box. They rap in every language. They rap in every fucking race, ethnicity, yep. genre. Fucking cowboy motherfuckers is rapping on country records, whatever the fuck. So <laughs> you can't tell an old dude not to rap. You can't tell a young dude how to rap. You can't tell motherfuckers what to like. You can't tell me that all this popular music that people like is whack because it's fucking popular. Right. Because cause in fact, and I remember this because I was listening to your album this morning, you brought Kid Rock mm -hmm. out essentially, right? Did you produce like his first album? Or, or? Well, I did some production with him on his first album. Right, that's back when he, he had came, the high top. Yeah, he came out to Oakland, we worked on a couple songs, and he flew back, I guess he was working out in New York at the time. And the next year, when Ice Cube quit NWA, me and Ice Cube did a tour together. And he took Yo-Yo, because that was the stipulation of the tour, you could bring one group. And I just took Kid Rock, because what he was doing, I liked his style, and you know, it's just, that's the kind of guy I am. So I, right. took, him, I, I took Kid Rock on his first real tour. Right. And that's, that's the story. And you know, and look, and he took all the shit from back then and... And repackaged it to repackaged the new Kid Rock. Repackaged it to the new Kid Rock and mm -hmm. now he's doing rock music but or whatever I'm the hell sure you call it. I'm sure his experience with us had a lot to do with his journey his evolution yeah exactly and it just kind of shows how hip-hop has evolved and now he's a country rock star yeah i don't know how you go from that to that but at the same time that's his evolution he made it work I know, 
But I also know that that is true to Detroit that you could be, yeah. you know, country rock and hip hop and fucking far right, white and 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 urban. <laughs> you could be all that shit. So yeah, and, in, and, in a city like Detroit, and people like you and me have always embraced all the new shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When people say XXX Tentacion is the new is the Tupac of this generation, I don't argue with it. I say okay, I I, I could see why people would feel that way. And also, um. He, he, he knew how to make records that, that, that g gave emotions to people. So yeah. uh, just speaking on an artist like that, before we even knew about his passing and everybody goes, oh, you know, he was popping. Oh, yeah. Like, and we, he didn't need our validation at all. He was popping. When he fucking got punched and went viral, he was popping before that. He was popping. So, so um, I think that artists like that, the best was yet to come. He was gonna make us recognize him at, all the way across the board because he was showing up at festivals, rocking the crowd. They, people were gonna find out. They were, they knew, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of that going on. A lot of that going on right now, and all the haterism and the criticism and shit. That's just man. When you sitting there and you talking down on somebody that's hustling harder than you and getting more money than you, and you sitting there going, "That shit is whack." That don't look good coming from you. It's not. It's not a good look. <laughs> yeah. When a motherfucker ride by in a Bentley, you go, "Oh, he's whack." Like, the, like let him live his fake Bentley life. If that's what you. If he saw fake in his Bentley, like, like live your fucking real yeah, ass man. Toyota life. I mean, whatever shit, do it. Yeah, man. Like you know, I interviewed Lil Yachty, and I, I said like I'm like, the only like quote unquote old head in in media that always supports you, never hates on you. I'm the only hip hop guy over 40 that actually defends you in interviews. Yeah, probably. Oh, probably over. Oh, who actually defends me? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, it, there's people out there who you know don't necessarily talk down or bad, but probably yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I can't necessarily say. I don't know what people are saying behind closed doors. I know a lot of people don't like me. You know what I mean? And I don't like everything that Yachty does. I think some of his shit is, you know, not that great. But he also has some bangers along mm -hmm. the way. And he's killing it, man. That's the beauty of hip-hop. I'm getting money. I've been getting money. I'm going to keep getting money. I don't give a fuck if you like me. You know what I'm saying? Right. It doesn't matter because there's so many motherfuckers that love what I do. Yep. I don't need a song in rotation on the radio. I don't need to be at the motherfucking awards on the red carpet uh, getting asked, what, what designer am I wearing? I don't need that shit. All I need is that fucking fan that loves my music. Yep, that's what it is. Too short, man. I'm looking forward to a lot more music, mm -hmm. you know, in the decades to come. Keep doing your thing. Keep killing it. Uh, if you haven't checked the new album, uh, the Pimp Tape, absolutely do it. Solid. The, the, for the guest appearances alone, it's <laughs> fucking crazy. You know solid, what I mean? It's a solid album. From the Schoolboy Q's. Very the educational chains, album, I must add. Very too. educational, very mm -hmm. Oakland. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I definitely see the, the influence all the way through. And uh, listen, man, I've always said you're my favorite Bay Area rapper. You know what I mean? I'm going to say it don't, again. Don't tell, him, don't tell him that, man. Nah, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I'm going to say it. My favorite Bay Area rapper of all time, man. Thank you so much for coming through. Till next time. All good, man. Peace.